Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I would like to talk about army lists. Now this is admittedly a bit of a personal bugbear of mine. But well, it's not necessarily the idea of army lists. It's people's reaction to other people asking about them. Particularly if those people have come from games which are quite army list heavy. Like Games Workshop games or infinity or malifaux something like that so i thought i'd do a video on it just to go through the process of selecting an army and then maybe dispelling some of the myths that go around that whole process so before we get started i should say i don't necessarily think this is a better way or a worse way of selecting your army for a game the other obvious way is either use a historically accurate order of battle or just throw everything you've got down on the table now, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong intrinsically with either of those two approaches. In fact, around the order of battle method, I've done a three-part series on selecting armies to do with that. I'll link it in the description below. But, uh, yeah, so there's nothing wrong with using orders of battle. But, equally, I don't think there's anything wrong with using the points values that are given at the back of the supplements for black powder as well. Certainly, they're given in the American Civil War and the Napoleonic supplements. I'm not sure if they're in Rebellion. They might be in the new printing, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, in the Napoleonic ones and the American Civil War, they definitely have the points values in the back because I've selected armies using them. So first of all, where does this idea that points values are a bad thing come from? Well, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I think one of the considerations that I've seen is people think that it's for people who want to make super cheesy armies who want to minimize the the poor elements of their army and maximize the good elements people who want to be competitive tournament gamers and you know what there's some validity to that if that's what you want to do in your hobby then that's absolutely fine i absolutely support that one of the most common napoleonic sets of rules for decades before black powder were WRG, they had points values, and they also used to run tournaments. I'm not sure they did for Napoleonics, but they certainly did for Ancients, and they even today still do for Ancients. And a lot of these people who would say, well, it's ridiculous you trying to use army lists and points to make a Napoleonic army, would more than happily go away and make an army list out of points for their Republican Romans or their Wars of the Roses, Lancastrians, whatever it would be. They're more than happy to do it for that, but there seems to be this sort of stigma against doing it in Napoleonic times. Now, I don't really know why that is, and it's not as if armies at the time didn't try and min-max their own organisations. I think the best example of that would probably be the Austrians, who underwent an entire regime change of what was happening in the military. Well, in fact, no, an even better example would be the Prussians, who almost completely changed their army from a Seven Years' War one up to an early modern one so it's it's not as if you know historically that armies and army boards weren't trying to for want of a better term min max their armies so it seems a little bit strange that people seem to have this big problem with it on the wargaming table the other thing i think as well is that people seem to think that because games workshop use points values as the basis of their games although they seem to be moving slightly away from that now but um yeah, because Games Workshop do, people just associate points values with fantasy. Now, this may go into why they're quite happy to use it for ancients and medievals. Because much less is known about those battles, they're sort of semi-fantasy anyway. Whereas Napoleonic's, you know, that's a good scholar's war. You know, we know exactly to the man how many people were on the field of Borodino and things like this. I mean, we don't, obviously. But uh, people seem to think that we do. So I think that is an issue. And, you know, it's, it's something that really frustrates me because I see it as being a barrier of entry. So many times I've seen on Napoleonic Facebook groups, someone comes in and says, oh, yeah, I've just picked up my starter set. I'm really excited. I've got into it from 40K or Fantasy or whatever. And, you know, how do I pick my first army? What's the normal points values? And the first 10 replies that come back are, oh, well, we don't use points values here. We only use orders of battle. What do you mean you don't know what an order of battle is, you filthy peasant? That's that's how it comes across, I'm afraid. So, you know, I, this is a calling people out a little bit, I guess. I don't want to be controversial, but nor do I want these new people to be driven away from the hobby because of some outdated, frankly snobbish ideas that some people in the community have. 
And there are tangible reasons to having a points value for your army. So the first one I would say is that they're really good for pickup games. So what I mean by pickup game is maybe you're down the club or maybe it's the first time that you're checking out a club and you talk to someone and they say, yeah, you know, blah, blah, let's sort out an Apollyonics game for next week. And then you can just say, how, how big do you want it? 500 points. The other guy goes, yeah, 500 points is fine. And then you go away and you know exactly where you stand. The next week comes and... You know, you're going to have a you know a relatively balanced game. I wouldn't say that the points values given in Black Powder are particularly great. They're they're not terrible, but they're I mean, you know, they do have their problems. Don't get me wrong. But uh, the idea there is that it just it again it allows that person to come into the hobby. You know, if if someone comes down the club for argument's sake, and they say to me, "Oh yeah, Tim, you know, I've, I really want to play Napoleonics. Blah, blah, blah. Let's have a game next week." And I say, "Okay, that's fine." Uh, you know, bring down what you've got. So he brings down what he's got, and he's got, you know, two regiments of infantry, and I bring down what I've got, and I've got, you know, the entire third corps or something, then yeah, it's not going to be a great game for that guy, is it? So it gives him something to aspire to. Well, I, I, well I'll come on to that in a separate point. But it gives him something to, to know and to collect to. And that's the second point, is that... It allows people to build structure into their army. Now, if you've seen the videos I did on starting the Vistula Legion, which this is sort of a spiritual successor to, then you'll see that one of the reasons why I wanted to do it is because it was a very self-contained formation. It only had three regiments, each of two battalions. So it's only really six infantry regiments. I mean, there's a couple more that you could squeeze in. But it's six or eight infantry regiments, two cavalry regiments. That's it. That, that's the entire Vistula Legion sword. So that's certainly one way of doing it from the Yours of Battle. But another way I could have done it is I could have said, right, well, I want to collect a Peninsula War army of X number of points. I could have then worked out what my army was going to be, and I could have then collected that army. One of the problems that I've really got at the moment, actually, I'm quite struggling with the painting wall, is that it just seems a bit never-ending. Now, you know, I'm my own worst enemy for this. I've just bought a Bavarian army. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not asking for sympathy. But what I am saying is that it sometimes just feels a bit never-ending. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, I finished this unit of Bavarians. Brilliant. I don't really get any sense of achievement from that because I look over and I've got seven more boxes waiting for me. So, you know, I, it, it gives you a goal to collect to. And I think that's the second really positive part of collecting armies to point values. The third point I want to make sort of goes off the first point, really, in that it creates those more balanced games. Now, if you're using an order of battle... It's probably not going to be that balanced. The entire purpose of a general is to not have a balanced battle. If you're fighting a balanced battle, you've done something wrong. That's why Wellington was such a great commander, because he didn't fight even battles. So again, you know, if our new chap comes to the club and I say, right, we're going to have this battle where the British army had two divisions and the French army had a battalion. Oh, by the way, you're going to be the French then it's not really going to be a great experience for him. Or even vice versa, if I say, you know what, you can be the Duke, and I'll be the French, you know, he's not going to really get much out of that game either. So it does allow that more balanced thing that historical scenarios don't. Now, don't get me wrong, you can find aspects of scenarios from history that are quite balanced, but by and large, it shouldn't really happen. I think the best way of finding that balanced scenario is to zoom in on a specific area of the battlefield because you might be locally balanced even though the strategic position is that you're actually quite heavily outnumbered or outgunned. I think a perfect example of this would be the Young Guard's attack on Place Noir against the Prussians. Now, there was absolutely no way on earth that the Young Guard were going to win that fight. I mean, they were against an entire Prussian army. But because they... Prussians arrived in dribs and drabs, you can actually create a battle out of that. But if you're going to do the whole Battle of Waterloo, including the Prussians, as you've seen in the videos I did on that, I'm not entirely sure that the French have much of a chance of winning, to be honest. Well, that said, no, um, yeah, I don't know, but you, you get my point. It's a similar thing, and this is a, going to be a complete tangent here, about when people set up the armies in the exact place that they set up historically. I, I never understand that. It's, I see it particularly in demonstration games at wargaming shows. I'm like, the whole point of being a general, like, 50% of your job is to deploy your troops. So, I, well, I don't know. Anyway, that's a complete tangent. We don't necessarily need to go into that. So, the fourth reason why I think 
uh, point values are a good idea. And this is the one I'm going to end with because I think, for me, this is the most important one. This is a very personal thing to me, so... I appreciate not everyone's going to feel as strongly about this as I do. <laughs> I can say that about the whole video, can I really? But uh, particularly on this one, is it allows you to build an army that is your army. Now, I think that's absolutely vital. Because you as the hobbyist, you're the one who's going to spend your money. You're going to spend your hours on painting these guys, basing them, researching them, doing everything you want. And to be forced to do specific regiments when you don't want to, it's not going to help you do that, is it? It's going to make you just, uh, you know, you know what? I don't, I'm not even bothered anymore. It really is for me, anyway. I find it a massive drain. So, for instance, I've done my British Army. Now, I didn't particularly have any sort of idea in mind of what I wanted to do. I've ended up sort of doing Picton's Third Division, but that's just sort of it seems to have fallen that way, really. But um, I mean, for instance, so I'll, I'd want to do my old regiment. So I'd want to do the Kings. So that's the Eighth. I'd want to do my dad's old regiment and my local regiment, the 33rd. That's now the Duke of Wellington's regiment. So I'd want to do them as well. Also, they've got red facings, which is quite different and quite cool. Now, I'd want to get some Highlanders in there because, you know, who doesn't love Highlanders? And I'd want to get some riflemen in there. So, you know, overall, that's four battalions, maybe five battalions, including some riflemen. Now, that formation never existed in reality. The 8th, the 33rd and, say, the Black Watch and Argyles and Southern Highlanders. They didn't fight together in the same brigade, but those are the four regiments I want to collect. So just because that didn't happen in history, why shouldn't I collect those regiments? I see absolutely no reason why I have to be constrained by what were almost certainly administrative things done 200 years ago. Those are the regiments I'm interested in, so those are the regiments I'm going to collect. An example of this would be I've painted a colour sergeant in my King's Regiment, in Trues, didn't happen. That was to uh, reference the uh, Liverpool Scottish Battalion, which were formed in the First World War. Uh, my colour sergeant, he was a member of that battalion, so that's why I've gone for that. It's historically, completely historically inaccurate, but because I've made that regiment my own, and I want to make the whole army my own. So for me, that's a huge thing. Because it's my time and my money and my effort, I want to make it my army. And by collecting the points, then I can do that to my heart's content. Right. Whew. So we're over 10, <laughs> we're over 12 minutes into the video. We can finally get started. I, if there's anyone still listening out there, thank you for putting up with my, uh, my rants there, really. One. Let me know in the comments below if you agree with me or particularly let me know if you disagree with me because i'd be really interested in opening up a dialogue here because i think it's something that we don't really talk about that's having a potentially devastating impact on people joining napoleonics so i'd be really interested to hear your views in the comments particularly if you think that points are a bad idea or if you've come to napoleonics from a different game system and points values give you that reassurance that reference back to what you know of wargaming but as always any comments in the uh, the comment box are, are well received i read them all but uh yeah particularly those ones then i'd be particularly interested to read them so right all that's done we can get on with the actual subject of the video which is selecting an army now i'm going to put some pictures up from clash of eagles this is the army selection page now i'm hoping that Warlord Games don't get funny about this. I know Games Workshop probably would because it shows the points values. But as we've seen, points values aren't necessarily as important in Napoleonic at the moment. So hopefully it won't be too much of a problem. So first things first, if you're going to collect to a points value, then you're going to need one of the supplements. Now there are basic army lists provided in the Black Powder rulebook. There certainly was in version 1. I'm not sure about version 2 to be honest. But these are like super, super simplified. And they don't really put in place the restrictions that give the lists their flavouring. So I would definitely recommend picking up the supplements. The one that we've got here is Clash of Eagles. So that's the invasion of Russia in 1812. It also will sort of do for 1813, 14 and 15. Well, 13 and 14 anyway. Uh, and there's all two more supplements. There's the Albion Triumphant Volume 1, which is the Peninsula. And Volume 2, which is 1815. That's Waterloo. 
So those are the three options that we've got at the moment. I'm going to do a video in the future on what I would like to see in an upcoming Austerlitz era one. Or possibly a Danube campaign one. But uh, that, that's for a future video. So those are the three options we've got at the moment. And it very much depends on which theatre you're interested in. I Personally, I think they're great books. I can't recommend them highly enough. I wouldn't necessarily say that you need to get them all. Unless you're, you're a crazy who wants to uh, do all the different eras and different periods and theatres. But uh, I would recommend that you at least get the one that you think you're going to use the most. Ultimately, if you use a Waterloo British Army against a Peninsula War French Army or an 1812 invasion of Russia, it's not the end of the world. I don't think it really matters. So find the one that's most interesting to you. If you're into the Waterloo campaign, you go for that one. If you're into Sharp and you want to refight the Battle of Talavera, then go for the Peninsula War one. So, yep, yeah, just get the one that you're most interested in first. You can always pick up the other ones later. Now... I'm going to go through an example of selecting an army here. And for that one, I, was, I thought I would try the most generic standard one I could think of. And that's a army selected from Clash of Eagles. And it's a part of the Grand Army, just a regular French line division. I would recommend if you're looking for a divisional size game, about 750 points would be what I'd suggest. I think 500 can give you a good brigade size game. And I think 1,000, you're looking at a heavy division, like a division plus plus, or a very, very small sort of two division formation. But 750 points seems to be about right for a single division. Now, while I said that this replaces orders of battle, it doesn't really. The idea here is that we use orders of battle to inform the division that we build but we don't slavishly follow the historical order of battle for a division in that army. So the actual army that starts at page 156 in the Clash of Eagles book, and we can see that there is one compulsory unit choice, and that is one to four infantry brigades. So we've got to have at least one brigade of infantry, and we can have up to four. Now, this is where the orders of battle are going to come into operation here. I'm basically going to look at how I can use the points to make a rough approximation of a standard French infantry brigade. So, it normally had two regiments, each of three battalions, and usually of a division would have two brigades, and one of those brigades would contain a light infantry regiment. Not always, but usually. So, let's do that here. So, we're going to keep it fairly straightforward. I'm going to pick one line infantry regiment of three battalions and at 38 points a unit that's 114 points for my second regiment i'm going to do the same again but i'm going to make these guys light infantry so they're going to be 41 points each and that's three battalions so 123 points adding a general de brigade at strategy rating eight for 25 more points and our first brigade comes out at 262 points for this, we've got six battalions on the table, three of which are light infantry, and a brigade commander. So I think that's a pretty good start. The second brigade in our division, we're going to do pretty much the same process, but the rules in italics at the bottom of the page say we can only have one light regiment per brigade. So as I said earlier, you'd, you wouldn't have more than that. Sometimes you wouldn't have any, but you probably wouldn't have two light infantry regiments in the same brigade so that's fair enough that said i think having a load more french is going to be a little bit boring so to change it up a little bit i'm going to swap in the portuguese legion because i bought them absolutely ages ago when warlord were doing a sprue sale and i'm just painting them up at the moment so i want it there in my mind i want to get the use out of them so i'm going to swap those guys in so the french line battalion again it's going to be three battalions sorry in that french line regiment i should have said for another 114 points and the portuguese are only one battalion of 36 points being very far from home i'm going to downgrade the portuguese to unreliable for a total of 33 points now with four battalions i think this brigade is a bit small so i'm going to add a third regiment remember i can add between one and four regiments in my brigade and this third regiment in this one i'm going to add another foreign one this time it's going to be an elite 
Regiment of the Swiss. Now, each Swiss regiment had two battalions, and while they were elite, they weren't super elite. So, I think we'll pay the extra to make them elite 5 plus, not elite 4 plus. Now, this comes to a total of 92 points for the pair, which is 38 points per battalion, plus 4 each for making them elite 5 plus. Now, did the Portuguese and Swiss share a brigade? Nope. Did French brigades usually consist of units from French and then two different Allied nations? Nope. Will it look cool, add a variety of colours to the battlefield, and allow me to change up my painting a little bit to have different troops and different colours? Absolutely it will. So, added to the 1st Brigade, we're on a running total of 501 points for 12 units of infantry. This might seem a lot, but we've not even got into the wacky, crazy, expensive units yet. We're also going to need to add a General de Brigade for this Brigade. I'm going to go with a strategy rating 7-1, so he is nice at the low, low value of... Free. So we've sorted the core of our infantry, and now we come to the second part of the holy trinity of Napoleonic Wargaming, artillery. Ignoring the regimental artillery, we turn to the facing page and see that we can have from the divisional artillery park. Now we're allowed one battery of guns per six battalions for a maximum of two batteries, as we've got 12 infantry battalions. This seems a little excessive to me, so I'm going to take one battery for 27 points. We can also take horse artillery... But as we've got no cavalry regiments yet, we'll have to come back to them later. Spoiler. So, speaking of cavalry, let's get on to them. Now, we're going to start with the light cavalry. We're allowed up to two light cavalry brigades, with a maximum of one per two infantry brigades. Having two infantry brigades, we are thus permitted one light cavalry brigade. Yeah, that's a lot of brigades. A light cavalry brigade consists of one to four regiments of cavalry, but I'm going to go for three. I want two regiments of Hussars and one regiment of those iconic French cavalry, the Lancers. Now, I really like Lancers, so I'm going to make them a large unit, meaning that they cost 48 points plus eight for a total of 56 points. Added to the total of two regiments of Hussars, 82, then these three re regiments of cavalry will set us back 138 points. Going for a general with a strategy rating of 8, we're on a running total of 691, because he's 25 more points. Now, being marauders, I'm expecting these guys to be tearing around the battlefield, and they're going to need some fire support. So if you flick back to the artillery page, a battery of horse artillery is 38 points, putting us all together on 729. So we've got 21 points to play with. Looking at my hussars, they look like mean fellows. They've certainly got that hard-bitten look of veterans. They'll have faced the horrors of Spain, seen their men being carried off by the guerrillas and had all sorts of horribleness done to them. So let's make them veterans for six points each. Now we're rapidly approaching the 750 points. We've only got nine left, so we've not got enough for any more units. We're going to be looking at unit upgrades. In this case... I could make an infantry battalion, say the 1st Battalion of the Light Infantry, Elite 5+, plus, and have one point left over. I think we could probably use that to make them tough fighters and hit 750 points on the nose. With a general of division at strategy rating 7, which is not a huge problem because they don't really do much in 2nd edition Black Power anyway. I think that is a problem with the rules, and that's something that I might look at when we do our My Dream 1809 book. So that's it. At 750 points, we've got 12 battalions of infantry, three regiments of cavalry, and two batteries of guns. One foot battery, one horse artillery. Is the army historically accurate? No, 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 no. There's way too much cavalry. The artillery is overrepresented. I've got a mix of far too many units from different nations in this army. But... It gives a flavour of the period. It's going to look quite varied on the battlefield. And I think anyone who is commanding this force will get a real feel of what Napoleonic Wargaming is all about. It's close enough, in my opinion, to be fun while maintaining the spirit of the historical armies. It's not like I've got, you know, one unit of infantry and then 15 regiments of Kraziers or something. <laughs> Although, to be fair, that would be pretty awesome. So, in addition to the three different arms of fighting. I've got a nice mix of units as well. We've got some red-coated Swiss, 
the brown clothed Portuguese, the all blue wearing French lights and the white and blue of the regulars to have a bit of a mixture and, you know, speed up the painting and just make it a bit more varied. Practically, the army is almost entirely available in plastic, with only the horse artillery and senior commanders needing to be metal. Importantly, there's also room for expansion, and I think that's really important. We can make it to the next level, a thousand points. We can add maybe a heavy cavalry brigade, perhaps some carabineers, or perhaps even a couple of battalions of grenadier appeared from the Imperial Guard. So, if you're interested in how I selected this army and gave a sort of a basic rough approximation of a French division at this time, then let me know if you'd like to see me do it for other nations. I quite enjoyed doing this process. So if you want a, a sample British army, a sample Russian army, sample Austrians, whatever, then let me know in the comments. Like I say, thank you very much for listening if you've stuck with it this long. There was a lot of numbers in there, so... Uh, yeah, I, I got confused between brigades and divisions. I hopefully edited all those out, but uh, if one snuck through, I do apologise. Thank you very much for listening. Like I say, it's not to say that using orders of battle to plan your games is wrong. I did a three-part series on how cool it is, but neither is using points. That's the, the thing I want to get across, is they're both equally valid methods of selecting armies. They've both got pros, both got cons. And I just hope that there's a bit more acceptance in the wider community that people who are coming from different systems, more used to using points, can use it as a way of making the leap to Napoleonics seem a little less daunting. I don't think the army that I've selected here is cheesy or over the top. I don't think it's looking to min-max and smash my opponent. It's just got a nice mixture of units and things that I would enjoy seeing on the tabletop that would create a bit of variation in my army. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope you're all staying safe. and see you in the next video. Goodbye.